It's so funny, and Angela. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our first uh, Diabetes Canada Guidelines Lunch and Learn. So this is our uh, topic around in-hospital management and um, management of hyperglycemia um, emergencies. I will say I'm getting some feedback from a few folks that may have just dialed in on the line. So if you don't mind, uh, for purposes of the presentation, just muting your line. Uh, and, until we get to the question and answer section. Um, so if you can, by hitting star six, that should mute your line. And if you wish to unmute your line when we are doing question and answer uh, later on as we progress here, you can do so by pound six. So star six to mute, pound six to unmute your line, or I guess in today's world, social media world, it would be hashtag six. <laughs> So if you could please do that, we'd very much appreciate it. Please do not put any um, uh, phones on hold. We do get some background music then if that is the case. So, so welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Angela Chapman. I'm the practice lead regionally for chronic disease, largely focused around the diabetes area, and um, have a, um, a, the honor of working with Dr. Richard Phillips, who's here to present for us today, and we'll do so with a few more Lunch and Learns we've got coming up uh, following Thursdays here in June and July. Uh, given the release of the new National Diabetes Canada guidelines that came out early April. Uh, so I'll do a quick introduction of Dr. Phillips and then allow him to add more that he might like to tell about his own story and then uh, pass it over to Dr. Phillips to carry on with the presentation. But uh, Dr. Phillips joined us in Interior Health. Um, I'm going to say July, I believe it was around that time frame from Victoria where he's been working as an endocrinologist for many years, so very happy to have him here in the Interior Health region. And somehow along the way, I was able to convince him to also, um, in addition to uh, being our only endocrinologist um, doing active practice here in the region, also step up and uh, support us as a health authority and region as the IH Diabetes Medical Lead. So uh, very happy to have him on board and present him today. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Phillips. Right. Well, thanks very much, um, Angela. And uh, this, this is our first lunch and learn, so we'll see how it goes. Hopefully, I won't uh, give everybody acute indigestion uh, in the process. So um, I thought I would start um, by hitting the highlights on the uh, hyperglycemic emergencies in adults chapter. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on that uh, for very long. I'm going to spend most of the time on the uh, inpatient hyperglycemia management section. Um, I, we uh, put together a number of slides on the latter topic, inpatient hyperglycemia, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and I've got far too many slides on that particular topic loaded at the present time. That's the, uh, uh, that ugly mug there on the lower right is mine. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll go through some of those slides uh, in a minute. But just going to uh, mention a few highlights on the hyperglycemic emergencies in adults chapter. Um, right off the bat, they, uh, they do make a distinction between uh, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, versus hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Um, the latter used to be called HONK, uh, but they've got rid of that terminology now. It's called uh, hyperglycemic, uh, hyperosmolar state, uh, partly due to the fact that uh, patients can have HHS and not be in a coma, therefore they, uh, they got rid of the coma. Uh, designation. Uh, DKA is much more common than uh, HHS, um, so uh, if any of you are working in uh, an ICU setting, you're going to see a lot more DKA than HHS. So I think um, one of the things that uh, is sort of a new uh, thing when it comes to DKA is uh, the fact that uh, one of the risk factors for it is the um, uh, increase in patients who are on insulin pumps. So one of the Achilles heels of insulin pump therapy uh, is the fact that they uh, are um, uh, pumping a rapid-acting insulin, uh, and there's no long-acting basal insulin uh, floating around in the background. Uh, so if and when the uh, insulin uh, cannula gets blocked, which it does from time to time, uh, there will be a lack of insulin delivery. Um, and if uh, the patient goes without their basal rate for more than four hours, then they will be absolutely insulin deficient and uh, ketones will develop uh, uh, shortly thereafter. So um, ketoacidosis is uh, 
uh, a complication of uh, insulin pump therapy if the um, insulin delivery is interrupted by a blocked cannula. Um, and if the insulin uh, basal rate is relatively low, certainly less than one unit per hour, uh, then the patient may not actually be notified by the pump uh, with uh, an occlusion alert. So it may be that the occlusion alert may not start ringing until many hours after the occlusion occurs. Uh, so I would see um, uh, frequently, not infrequently, patients on insulin pumps presenting with DKA because their, their insulin infusion set was blocked. They were giving correction doses through the pump. It wasn't getting through, uh, and they ended up in that particular problem. So I'm sure all of you have seen that before. Uh, the other thing that's a relatively new phenomenon is this whole issue of people with type 2 diabetes developing ketoacidosis uh, shortly after starting uh, this new class of drugs known as the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, drugs like Invokana and, and Jardians uh, and Forsega. And uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. It's very rare, uh, but it's not so rare that we don't see it. I've, I've certainly seen half a dozen cases over the past couple of years um, from this phenomenon. And it's interesting that uh, it seems to be um, uh, due to the fact that the drugs increase uh, glucagon levels. So if the patient responds well to an SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, their blood sugars will be lower and hence their, uh, uh, their insulin levels will, will be lower, but the drug increases glucagon. So what you'll see is that you'll see a shift in the insulin to glucagon ratio, less insulin, more glucagon, and that is a setup for developing ketoacidosis if an intercurrent illness was to occur. So uh, one of the cautions is that if patients with type 2 diabetes who are on this drug class uh, develop an intercurrent illness or if they're going for major surgery, uh, that the drug needs to be held. Um, so we've added the SGLT2 inhibitors to the so-called sad man's group of drugs to hold if, uh, if people are ill. The one other thing I'll say about ketoacidosis and type 2s is um, there's a not infrequently uh, seen phenomenon of ketosis-prone type 2 diabetes. Um, and this was originally described in the U.S. in African Americans um, when it was initially called flatbush diabetes, uh, which I believe is an area of New York. Uh, we'll, we, we will see ketosis-prone type 2 diabetes in our region uh, most often in uh, uh, people of First Nations background. So they'll present with type 2 diabetes with very, very high blood sugars. They may actually have ketoacidosis as part of it, um, but they're most likely not uh, a type 1 diabetic. It's most likely uh, a manifestation of um, uh, first presentation of type 2. So they would need to be treated with insulin initially, but ultimately can come uh, off the insulin and, and can be treated with uh, metformin and lifestyle. So the, uh, um, th there's nothing terribly new in the hyperglycemic emergencies in adults chapter on the treatment of DKA. Uh, Interior Health recently came out with a updated um, uh, um, protocol for uh, treatment of um, adult DKA and HHS. Uh, came out uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, and it's basically based on the um, the Diabetes Canada guidelines from before. Uh, not much has changed uh, in the interim, um, and I was asked to comment on those guidelines before they went out, and I, I, I did um, sort of focus on a number of things. So when you're treating DKA uh, in the ICU or in a step-down unit, um, there are a number of uh, sort of big factors you need to focus on. So number one, you need to uh, perform volume resuscitation. You got to give people uh, normal saline in appropriate amounts. That's number one. Number two, you need to treat the acidosis. The acidosis is treated with the intravenous insulin. No change in the rate, which is still recommended to be 0 0.1 units per kilo per, uh, per hour. So generally, 70 kilogram person comes in, they be started at seven units per hour. Uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, Diabetes Canada is not recommending uh, uh, an insulin bolus intravenously to start off with. No evidence that that's of any benefit. You just put people on uh, volume resuscitation and IV insulin, 0.1 unit per kilo per hour. Uh, the 
thing that can lead to major morbidity and potentially mortality when you're treating DKA is if you induce hypokalemia. So it's very important that uh, potassium resuscitation starts early on. So once the potassium is, is less than 5.5 and uh, the patient has a urinary output, then you should be aggressively uh, uh, replacing potassium uh, between 20 and 40 uh, millimoles per, uh, per liter uh, to avoid hypokalemia because the insulin that you're giving intravenously is going to push potassium back into cells. Uh, as the acidosis clears, the potassium will be push back into cells, and you can actually uh, induce hypokalemia. So very important to, to watch the potassium. Clearly, uh, I, I had to um, uh, remind my ICU colleagues that the, the reason that you're giving the IV insulin is not to treat the hyperglycemia, but it's to treat the acidosis. So as the glucose is coming down, we don't want them to lower the the insulin infusion until the acidosis is cleared. What we do suggest is that once the glucose is down to 14 millimoles per liter, uh, that instead of turning off the insulin, uh, that you just add back some glucose into the IV. Yeah, you certainly cut back the, uh, the IV insulin by 50%, but you have to keep it going. Add back some glucose to the, uh, the IV infusion to keep the blood sugar somewhere between 10 and 14. Um, but for God's sake, don't turn off the insulin until the acidosis is cleared. Uh, once the glucose is down to the 10 to 14 range um, and you're monitoring the electrolytes, uh, what often happens is that these people will have a free water deficit, and you'll see that as the glucose comes down, the serum sodium is climbing. And if the sodium uh, is climbing too high, then, then you need to address the water deficit by using uh, half normal saline with potassium as opposed to the normal saline. Uh, and the final thing, uh, the thing that will kill patients apart from not treating the acidosis and overly uh, uh, driving down the potassium is not looking for the precipitant. So what caused the DKA in the first place? And we should be aggressive at looking for uh, potential infections, looking for underlying uh, myocardial infarction or stroke, uh, looking for underlying uh, drug mischief uh, like cocaine. Uh, a very common cause of, of DKA that we would see um, as endocrinologists was uh, people with psychosocial uh, barriers um, that uh, you know, weren't doing well um, from a psychosocial point of view, uh, and hence they would not be taking their insulin appropriately. They had high A1Cs to begin with, uh, they would miss a dose of insulin here or there. Uh, they would get sick for other reasons, and boom, uh, they would be in full-blown TKA. These were the so-called frequent flyers um, that uh, would come into the emergency room every month, um, and uh, it's due to their psychosocial situation. So um, I didn't want to belabor the uh, DKA stuff too much longer. The only other pearl I would say about um, the... Uh, uh, emergencies on the HHS side, and that is that when patients have hyperosmolar uh, uh, hyperglycemic state, uh, they are um, uh, in a hypercoagulable state as well. And I've certainly seen some uh, vascular catastrophes related to either deep venous thrombosis or even arterial thrombosis. Uh, when people are being treated for HH, HHS. So for older individuals that have uh, significant hyperosmolarity, uh, the serum osmolarity greater than 320 associated with central nervous system uh, compromise, these people need to be on uh, aggressive um, DVT prophylaxis, so low molecular weight heparin, um, to avoid uh, that, uh, that possibility. So I think that's important from my perspective. Um, what else? Can I can I move on to the um, to the inpatient management? Yes. Why don't we and then we'll, um, allow to, uh, just for our audience, we'll allow time for at least fifteen minutes of the question uh, for all parts, the hyperglycemic emergencies and the other. And and just a reminder, if you can, we're getting some feedback. To star six to mute your line. Thank you. Okay. Continue there, Dr. Phillips. Thank you. Okay. So. Moving on to the inpatient hyperglycemia uh, talk, um, I'm just going to move move along to um, select slides. So clearly, hyperglycemia 
uh, in hospital, very common. Uh, this is an interesting study from Atlanta um, that uh, um, defined hyperglycemia in the inpatient setting as any glucose over 7.8. In this particular community hospital, 38% of hospitalized patients had hyperglycemia, 26% uh, with known diabetes, 12% with newly diagnosed hyperglycemia. Um, so uh, hyperglycemia is out there and it's lurking. Um, stress hyperglycemia is a term that you may, you may be familiar with, um, defined as a random glucose over 7.8 in acutely ill patients without a prior diagnosis of diabetes, which normalizes with recovery from the illness. Um, so that's the definition of stress hyperglycemia. Um, and uh, very common. The, um, uh, one of the changes to the Diabetes Canada guidelines is they're recommending that a random glucose be performed in all patients hospitalized with acute illness just due to this high incidence rate so that we can pick up uh, people with otherwise uh, uh, undiagnosed hyperglycemia and or diabetes. Um, so random glucose on everybody that's admitted. If the glucose is over 7.8, uh, they're recommending that you do a hemoglobin A1C. Uh, if the random glucose is high but the A1C is normal, that would suggest that the patient has stress hyperglycemia as opposed to uh, uh, undiagnosed type 2 or type 1 for that matter. Uh, if the A1C is elevated above 6.5%, uh, then that's a, a new diagnosis of, uh, of diabetes. Um, in addition, if you have somebody with known diabetes that's coming into the hospital, uh, they're recommending that you, um, if, if that person has not had a, a recent A1C within the past two to three months, that the A1C be updated um, for a couple of reasons. So if you have known diabetes and you're in hospital and you have a high A1C, that predicts that the amount of insulin you, that you will need to give to keep them under control in hospital will be higher than otherwise. And it also prompts you to uh, at least think about um, uh, sort of increasing the intensity of the therapy once they once they leave hospital, uh, so that uh, so that that's uh, that's addressed as part of their discharge planning. So, many many barriers to uh, inpatient glycemic management. Um, so, uh, pe people are on glucocorticoids. They're uh, they're having infections. They have stress of illness. Uh, they're on non physiological forms of nutrition, uh, TPN and tube feeds. Um, factors predisposing to hypoglycemia are very common. Uh, advanced age, uh, uh, alterations in oral intake, renal insufficiency, um, and uh, other issues. So it's not easy to control the blood sugars um, at the best of times. So why do we care? Well, the reason why we care is that hyperglycemia is actually harmful. Um, and for our purposes, um, I'll draw your attention to um, the uh, study three-quarters of the way down on this slide by Finley McAllister, who's a classmate of mine from the University of Alberta, um, Finley, uh, class of 1990. Uh, he published this study. So hyperglycemia associated with worse outcomes in patients admitted to hospital with, with community-acquired pneumonia. So the hyperglycemia uh, predicts worse outcomes. Uh, one thing that's quite interesting is that uh, the relative risks associated with hyperglycemia are greater for those without a prior history of diabetes. So if you're not known to have diabetes and you come in with hyperglycemia, that predicts that you'll have a, uh, a worse outcome. So uh, moving along to uh, this particular study, um, hyperglycemia, independent marker of in-hospital mortality. Look at the, the middle uh, section of this. So if you are not known to have diabetes and you presented with hyperglycemia, in this particular study, there was a 10% in-hospital mortality rate. So hyperglycemia predicts bad outcomes. Um, what about the corollary of that? If, uh, does treating hyperglycemia reduce complications? Uh, and the answer is um, yes uh, in various clinical settings, but the evidence behind uh, lowering glucose in various clinical settings varies. So this is the basis of uh, the Diabetes Canada guidelines. So they consider um, the evidence for strict control of glucose for cabbage patients as being grade A, level 1A. Uh, in the critically ill ICU patient, uh, keeping their blood sugar less than 10, uh, they consider that grade B, level 2 evidence. For 
uh, most of the patients we're seeing, non-critically ill on medical and surgical floors, the, the evidence isn't as good. It's actually grade D consensus. So I think that's important to, uh, to recognize. So um, we won't belabor the, this particular slide, but just to, if you can see my arrow there, um, uh, treating hyperglycemia in hospital increases the risk of hypoglycemia. It decreases the risk of um, infection. Um, so there's a trade-off, right? So there's good things about treatment, but you've got to be careful about inducing hypoglycemia. Um, so the evidence behind treating people on the medical and surgical floors uh, is mixed. Okay, next. Um, so here are the treatment targets, uh, 2018. Um, for non-critically ill hospitalized patients with diabetes, they're recommending pre-meal glucose target between 5 and 8 millimoles per liter uh, and postprandial or random glucose less than 10. For medical, surgical, critically ill patients in the ICU, um, uh, keeping the blood sugars less than 10, good evidence, uh, somewhere between 6 and 10, um, a little less uh, robust evidence. Uh, patients undergoing cabbage, uh, good evidence, 5.5 to 11.1. Uh, I didn't mention uh, patients uh, perioperatively, 5 to 10 is the current recommenda uh, recommended range. So um, the, the downside, of course, is hypoglycemia. Uh, we know that hypoglycemia is harmful, uh, not only in the ICU setting, but also on the ward. Uh, there was a, a big study um, that came out of Canada called the Nice Sugar, uh, study uh, in ICUs published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009, and uh, they found that intensive insulin therapy, four and a half to six millimoles per liter in the ICU with IV insulin was associated with a greater risk of hypoglycemia and a higher risk of mortality compared to less intensive insulin therapy. So that's why they backed off, backed off on the intensity there. But it's also true on the ward in this particular study in 2009 by Turkin, and I'll just... Uh, put over the, um, uh, the next slide. Now, these are people, uh, th this is showing that the lower the blood sugar, the higher the, um, the in-hospital mortality rate. Now, less than 30 milligrams per deciliter is super low. This is like less than 1.2 millimoles per liter, uh, and, and, and less than 39 is, uh, is about 2.2 millimoles per liter. So hypoglycemia does increase in-hospital mortality, um, but we're talking really, really low blood sugars here. Um, uh, less than four isn't going to do it, but once you're getting less than three, uh, then you're definitely getting into danger territory. So hypoglycemia does uh, associate not only with inpatient mortality, um, but also in, uh, in this particular study, mortality uh, upwards of one year post-discharge from hospital. This particular slide was simply saying that um, if you become hypoglycemic spontaneously in hospital because you're sick, uh, then that has an extraordinarily high uh, rate of mortality. Uh, in this particular study, you can look at the bottom, non-insulin-treated hypoglycemia group, 34% mortality versus the uh, control group that didn't have hypoglycemia, 34% versus 1%. But this particular study also showed that if in the insulin-treated group, that if you became hypoglycemic less than 2.8, that there was a mortality associated with that, 20% versus 4.5%. So hypoglycemia needs to be avoided. So, so far, just to briefly review, uh, hyperglycemia is common. Hyperglycemia is associated with worse outcomes, especially if you're not known to have diabetes to begin with. Uh, hypoglycemia spontaneously is a bad marker. Uh, if you're on insulin and we induce hypoglycemia, uh, that's also um, something to be avoided uh, based on the literature. So uh, moving right along, uh, so we've, we've discussed the role of um, checking the random glucose and or hemoglobin A1C upon admission. Um, and uh, what about oral agents? Um, the CDA, I shouldn't say CDA, the Diabetes Canada guidelines are stressing that if, uh, if you're hyperglycemic in hospital and you're, and you're acutely ill, that the treatment of choice remains insulin as opposed to oral agents or non-insulin injectables. And there's a number of reasons for that. Metformin, of course, um, uh, m many patients who are acutely ill uh, have renal dysfunction. 
uh, people have hypoxic states that can lead to an increased risk for lactic acidosis. So metformin is out. Sulfonylureas, hypoglycemia. TZDs, fluid retention. DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, probably safe to use, but probably not efficacious enough. Um, uh, there is one study showing that their use with basal insulin could be, could be helpful, but generally speaking, it's not on formulary. We don't use it. Uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, slow gastric empty and cause nausea, not a great time to start those drugs. And the SGLT2 inhibitors, I think, need to be avoided because of this issue of euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. So avoid them. Um, the uh, euglycemic DKA, uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, on the uh, hyperglycemic emergency uh, thing. Um, this is an interesting case series from the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. Perioperative uh, implications of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So these were three cases of people who went for open heart surgery. The uh, uh, Invocana or Jardiance was, was held one to two days before surgery, and despite that, on day one post-op, all these patients developed ketoacidosis. So there's really no consensus on how soon we have to stop these drugs prior to major surgery. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an unknown at the present time. Okay, so just to uh, uh, move on to the meat of the matter, um, once we've decided that a, a patient has hyperglycemia and they're in hospital and they need treatment and we've decided that we're going to treat them with insulin, uh, how do we do that? And the age-old... Uh, method uh, that I was taught when I was a medical student uh, that didn't work whatsoever was the traditional sliding scale um, paradigm. Um, so you would tr uh, throw um, R insulin uh, at the uh, patient if the blood sugar was above 10, uh, and if it was less than 10, then you wouldn't give them any insulin. And it didn't work, um, and uh, thus uh, newer methods are required. So the uh, best way of doing it, and as recommended by Diabetes Canada, is to use basal bolus insulin. Now, specifically using scheduled subcutaneous insulin with a background component with basal insulin, a, a meal or prandial component, bolus insulin with a rapid-acting analog, as well as required a correction or supplemental insulin if the blood sugar happens to be higher than ideal. So there's three components um, to the, uh, the basal bolus insulin program. And the, um, the reason for coming out with the physician-prepared order sets is to encourage uh, and to facilitate uh, order, uh, ordering physicians uh, or nurse practitioners to, uh, to use this basal bolus method, um, uh, which allows them to, to um, pick a basal dose, a, schedule, a scheduled meal dose, and uh, an ISF or insulin uh, uh, correction factor um, for their patients, um, as opposed to using the sliding scale. So the trick is, how do you actually do it? So um, where this all came from, the, 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 the monumental or the, the paradigm study um, that uh, is driving the Diabetes Canada guidelines is the so-called RABBIT-2 trial uh, by uh, Umpieras. He's also down in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, published back in 2007. Um, I think it's worthwhile just quickly blasting through this um, a randomized control trial. Um, relatively small numbers of insulin-naive type 2 diabetic, diabetics admitted to a medical floor, randomized to sliding scale versus basal bolus. The basal bolus dose was 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 units per kilo per day, um, depending on whether their admission glucose was low or high. Uh, there was a, a very aggressive uh, supplemental scale um, for the sliding scale and the basal bolus uh, group. The primary endpoint was uh, glucose control in hospital. And you can see that uh, the uh, solid circles was the uh, basal bolus insulin, uh, improved glucose control in hospital compared to sliding scale. Uh, they also did a surgery trial, same sort of idea. Uh, they used uh, uh, 0.5 units per kilo per day of the basal bolus insulin uh, or sliding scale in surgical patients. Same sort of thing, improved glucose control uh, throughout the admission and uh, throughout the day. Uh, in addition to that, they showed a reduction in hard endpoints. Specifically, if you look at the number of patients with complications, sliding scale, 26, basal bolus insulin, 9, 
statistically significant. Um, now, this still uh, isn't, you know, the numbers are relatively small. Uh, that's why the, uh, um, uh, the level of evidence is still considered grade D as compared to uh, the um, uh, CABG patients. Uh, but this is the best evidence that we have um, that this is safe and effective uh, treatment. Um, well, barriers to the use of the basal bolus insulin. This is still not used universally by any stretch. Um, all endocrinologists use the basal bolus insulin program, but not everybody's an endocrinologist. You know, um, hyperglycemia is frequently not the focus of the admission. So you're in with a broken leg and people are focusing on that as opposed to the blood sugars. You know, there's complexity to this. Uh, not, our, not every uh, um, provider is going to feel comfortable with ordering insulin. Um, there's, you know, nursing workload issues. They have to test the blood sugar. Uh, they have to follow the, uh, the, um, the protocol for calculating the bolus and the correction. They've got to administer the insulin within 15 minutes of a meal. It's very difficult. Um, the insulin doses may change as the, uh, uh, as the uh, patient gets either sicker or better as the admission progresses. So there has to be a change in the dosing as, as, as time goes on. And insulin is a high alert medication. There is a, a risk of hypoglycemia um, that can have bad outcomes, as we've mentioned. Uh, when I left Victoria, the uh, people there gave me a coffee mug uh, with one of my famous quotes on it. I'll, I'll just leave it for your reading there. I haven't changed my mind about that. So uh, how do we order insulin? How are we doing for time? I better hurry up. <laughs> so uh, insulin order is made easy. So if the patient's on basal bolus insulin at home, and they'll be eating uh, in hospital, then one continues the home regimen. If their uh, A1C is quite well controlled at home, uh, then generally speaking, um, it's a good idea to reduce the total daily dose by about 25%, uh, as generally speaking, they'll be eating less in hospitals than they do at home. Uh, if their A1C is very high at home, then there wouldn't be the same reason to reduce the uh, total daily dose. Many type 1 diabetics feel comfortable with self-management, so I think we need to have that discussion. So if you think that the patient is capable of continuing their own uh, self-management, uh, then they could be encouraged to do so. This includes insulin pump patients, um, and uh, we do have um, a, a process uh, and a consent form uh, in the interior health uh, protocol uh, to allow patients to continue their insulin pump therapy if they're a good candidate. Um, so if the patient is not on basal bolus uh, insulin at home, yet they're in hospital acutely ill and still eating, how do we decide on their total daily dose? So generally speaking, it'll be somewhere between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5 units per kilogram per day, depending on what their admission glucose is, with a lower total daily dose if they're elderly or have renal impairment, starting at 0 0.3 units per kilo per day for those folks. Um, the uh, higher doses, 0 0.6 units per kilo per day or higher, um, is considered a threshold uh, below which the odds of hypoglycemia are lower. So sticking to this, this sort of 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 units per kilo per day total daily dose is a starting point. Uh, once you have the total daily dose, half of it is given as a long-acting basal, usually insulin galargine once a day at bedtime. The other 50% is given as meal-related insulin, novo rapid before each meal, uh, as long as the patient's eating. Um, the correction dose, uh, you calculate it by using the rule of 100. So you divide 100 by the total daily dose, and the result is your ISF. So if they're um, 100, if they're on 50 units per day, 100 divided by 50 is 2. Uh, therefore, the correction dose is 2. Uh, 2 units of aspart reduces the glucose by 2 millimoles um, approximately. So if the patient misses a meal on that regimen, then you omit the prandial insulin. Um, if the patient is hyperglycemia, hyperglycemic and is not eating that particular meal, then you would simply give the correction dose. You don't give the, the meal-related dose, but you would give the correction dose even if they're not eating. The basal insulin continues whether they're eating or not. Um, we don't want to get into a situation where if the patient remains hyperglycemic and all the physician does is crank up the lantus dose without giving any prandial insulin. That leads to something called over-basalization 
which when they become NPO, uh, the patient will become hypoglycemic a few hours later. So avoid over basalization. So if the patient is admitted and they're NPO, uh, then you're just going to be using a basal insulin only uh, and potentially a uh, uh, correction factor if they're hyperglycemic. How do you calculate the basal dose? Uh, for most patients, it'll be between 0 0.2 and 0 0.25 units per kilo per day, depending on the admission glucose. Um, don't, uh, don't order prandial insulin because they're not eating. Um, and uh, one calculates the uh, ISF um, by the rule of 100. Uh, this time it's uh, the total daily dose multiplied by 2. 100 divided by that product is your ISF. It's fairly simple. Um, do's and don'ts. So if you see that uh, the patient's on the basal bolus insulin program and uh, the blood sugars are frequently going below 5, that usually means that the uh, insulin dosing needs to be reduced to avoid hypoglycemia. If the um, ISF is being used uh, daily, if, if you're having to use a correction dose um, frequently, then the scheduled dose needs to be increased so that you don't have to use the correction dose. Um, one of the things that people do is they crank up the basal without adding or increasing the prandial insulin. Uh, it's important not to do that. And it's important to look at the glucose levels every day or two uh, following pattern recognition uh, and adjust the dose based on what's happening clinically. What about the uh, uh, use of a correction dose at bedtime? There was a study that looked at that, uh, doing a correction dose versus not using a correction dose. The fasting blood sugar the next day in this particular study was the same regardless of whether you did that or not because using a bedtime correction dose um, can increase the risk of hypoglycemia, generally speaking, uh, it's not recommended to do that. Um, I'm going to skip over the Basal Plus trial and the site of hospital. Uh, premix insulins are generally not recommended for acutely ill patients in hospital. Um, this particular study in Diabetes Care 2015 compared basal bolus insulin with premix insulin uh, and had to be discontinued prematurely because of the uh, huge rate of hypoglycemia in the premix group. 64% uh, of people were going hypoglycemia. They had to stop the trial. So um, premix insulins are only uh, potentially useful in people that are no longer acutely ill. They're stable. Uh, they're eating uh, consistently. You're not looking for perfect control, just reasonable control. And it's potentially an older individual that's uh, waiting for placement uh, or waiting to go back home. Uh, premix in that situation is reasonable, uh, but not in acutely ill patients. Um, there's a number of um, sort of special situations that we could deal with uh, also um, when it comes to steroids, uh, tube feeds, TPN, et cetera. But I wonder whether I should just open it up to questions if people uh, want to ask sp specific questions about those special situations. This might be a good time to do that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Um, so, yeah, we do have seven minutes left to close, so we're probably time for a few questions. So, again, if you are muted, you can unmute by uh, hashtag six. And if you have any questions at this time, please feel free to call in. Just a reminder, we are recording, so, um, so this may be shared with others around the region just for your awareness. Hi, it's Logan Cranberg. Um, my question is, uh, thank you so much for this um, update. Um, and, you know, I've done some inpatient, but I was never aware or privy to these tables that you shared with the, the guidelines, like for how many units per kilogram for starting. I'm wondering if you could share that information with us, particularly like if they're NPO to start the basal at 0 0.2 units if their blood sugar is less than 11.1, .1, and then the other one with the TM creatinine greater than 177 and age greater than 70. Right. Um, it, it, it's, um, uh, I, I believe, uh, Angela, that this whole um, inpatient hyperglycemia slide deck is available um, to people to, to uh, is it, do they have access to the whole thing or just the abbreviated one? Um, probably the abbreviated one, but we can certainly through this recording make it accessible on our Diabetes Clinical Care Resources page and Inside Net, so I can send uh, follow-up information about how to access that, but yes, certainly we can. Yeah, and, uh, and, and to mention that the, uh, the Diabetes Canada guidelines do mention 
um, you know, the, the use of basal bolus insulin, and they do talk about, you know, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 units per kilo per day total daily dose with half as basal, half as bolus, uh, but they don't go into any more detail than that in the Diabetes Canada chapter. So what I provided for you is sort of more of a, um, a synopsis of the literature in the last few years um, that I had to do to put these slides together. Um, and uh, th those numbers come from the, um, the randomized clinical trials uh, that were done that, that uh, showed that basal bolus insulin was superior, superior to uh, sliding scales. That's where those numbers come from. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Other questions? Pound six. Hey, well, Dr. Phillips, if there's not any immediate questions now, there may people may be percolating and musing over the information. Did you want um, to walk through any of the other slides at this time, or? Um, yeah, um, I think one of the areas that's um, that's important to uh, discuss is the, is the whole issue of transition to home. Um, so passing the baton to the uh, the community. Um, so I'll, I'll blast through some of this stuff. So um, clearly. If the patient was doing well before they came into hospital, simply resuming their usual outpatient regimen is appropriate. Um, if patients are new to insulin, um, it's important that uh, they receive insulin teaching before they leave, obviously. Uh, generally, we're providing them with survival skills um, with uh, follow-up as an outpatient to, uh, to fine-tune things. Um, it's good to give oral and written instructions on uh, doses of insulin and the timing um, and to make sure that uh, it's identified which um, health care provider will be responsible for follow-up and adjustment of the insulins, whether that be a diabetes clinic or a primary care physician. Uh, the primary care physician needs to be notified what the discharge insulin regimen is, and I think that um, a lot of work has gone into this whole issue of transition to home uh, through the interior health um, uh, policies and procedures, uh, I think we're doing a, a good job in that regard. Um, now, uh, clearly basal bolus insulin is appropriate while people are acutely ill as inpatients. Uh, not everybody needs to go home on basal bolus insulin, however. So um, if it's uh, identified that people need to go home on insulin, um, if you can avoid the basal bolus insulin program upon discharge, that would be in the patient's best interest because it's, it's, it's a complex regimen and many people can't, can't do it. So if you can uh, send them home on some form of oral agent um, as well as perhaps uh, a, uh, a portion of their basal insulin, 50 to 80 percent of the inpatient dose, um, so oral agents during the day, bedtime basal insulin at a reduced dose upon discharge, that'll be a simplified uh, way of doing it, uh, and then the, uh, the community people can, can take it from there. So I think that's a, a useful thing. Um, I'm not sure what else I need to focus on. I'll, I'll flip through some slides and see if there's anything else while people mull over some questions. And well, we are just one minute to time, so do, um, any closing uh, remarks, Dr. Phillips, and then um, I'll, I'll close with a few comments about how we'll share the information out. Right. Uh, well, my, my only comment would be that uh, I, th I think we've done a good job at coming up with um, PPOs for people to use in various clinical circumstances, um, but simply having the PPOs doesn't mean that the insulin will be ordered um, uh, effectively. So I think the next push from my point of view is to make sure that people um, not only have access to the PPOs but uh, know how to fill them in properly and adjust them uh, to maintain safe and good glucose control in hospital. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, and I, I think um, for all on the line, I know we've got a lot of nurses, some pharmacists, I believe some dietitians and others. So again, if we have a, an enhanced collective awareness, I think we can always then be helping to inform one another and our prescriber partners as well to that end. So thank you very much for, I know what was a large amount of information to work through, Dr. Phillips. Uh, and thank you to those take, for taking your lunch hour uh, at this meeting. If you do have any burning questions after the fact, uh, you can. Email
email uh, that diabeteseducation at interiorhealth.ca. Just put in the subject line June 7 uh, inpatient diabetes management session, um, and then you know we can maybe take some questions offline if you have some musings after the after the recording. And we will be um, posting these accessible through our Diabetes Inside Net Clinical Care Resources page as well. Um, so please pass that message along to colleagues if they weren't able to attend today. And if you haven't already um, uh, registered, we do have some upcoming sessions, although I believe most of June is already full, so uh, but a few spots left for the July session. So thank you, Dr. Phillips, and thank you all for taking your time today. Thank you. Thanks so much.